my husband Eric his father was with the State Department and they traveled all over the world uh, but primarily Europe so not everywhere but there there was an influx of all kinds of different ways of cooking so they lived in Germany they then lived in Mexico and his mother uh, in Guadalajara and his mother learned all kinds of uh, Mexican and traditional dishes they lived a very uh, uh, Mexican lifestyle while they were in Guadalajara and they were in Sweden they were in Copenhagen and uh, they were in Moscow for a while my husband's maternal uh, grandmother was uh, in Helsinki and so there was a lot of seafood there was a lot of Scandinavian influences in the way things were prepared and cooked and then my paternal uh, no my husband's paternal family was from the south from the deep south and there was they were originally from Charleston South Carolina uh, his ancestors were some of the first to land in South Carolina and their cooking was very very traditional southern um, with some gula influence as well um, that's the the sea islands influence on the cooking and my my mother-in-law cooked a lot from the charleston receipts cookbook from the junior league of um of charleston and she learned a lot of her southern dishes from that and from her mother-in-law so we had the scandinavian influences we had a lot of german there was uh, german nights and german cooking my uh my mother-in-law also could cook a lot of great Mexican food uh, of all different types, not just border Mexican food. And a lot, did I say seafood? I think I said seafood, but I had grown up being someone who had not developed the taste buds for seafood. But once I was introduced into their family, I really learned to appreciate everything from crab cakes and uh, shrimp scampi, uh, Charleston shrimp dish, all kinds of other fish dishes. And then one of the things that we did, and it was, it had a lot of fish included, was a Scandinavian meal and you ate um, herring. It was pickled herring and you had the pickled herring with different types of crisp bread and cheeses from uh, Scandinavia and uh, and then my father-in-law would always um, toast me and we drank something called aquavit it's a very strong liquor uh, you keep it in the refrigerator it's stronger than drinking straight vodka we drank it in little thimble glasses but the tradition was that any time a gentleman looks at you and says skull, you have to look them in the eye, click your glass or raise your glass and down the aquavit. Well, after doing it about two or three times, my father-in-law would have me loosened up for the rest of the night. Very, very good food. My mother-in-law also was very traditional in serving meals by the course. So there would be appetizers as you stood around, and then there would be a first course, uh, usually of some kind of soup. And then there were even meals where we had a fish course and then a regular meat course, followed by um, cheese and fruit, and then dessert. And my father-in-law was a wine connoisseur and they were fortunate enough to live in Europe. They met in Paris right after World War II. So he was something of an expert in wines and French wines. So a lot of these special occasions, there would be as many as five different wines to drink and you drank them at different courses in the meal. Uh, sometimes you would start off with champagne with your appetizers 
and then there would be some type of a white wine with your um, your first course of soup and your fish course if it was served that way and then there would be a couple of red wines with the main meal and the one of the reasons we had cheese and fruit and and then some kind of fantastic bread was to then sit around uh, have conversations and um, enjoy another wine another red wine and then my mother-in-law made homemade all of our desserts and there would be a dessert wine or the men would want to drink cognac and the women usually weren't ready for cognac at that time and and drank the uh, the lighter wine although in later years um, my mother-in-law did enjoy having some some cognac with with the guys one of my mother-in-law's favorite times of the year was Easter and she started having large Easter brunches about the time that my husband and his brother married they would have a lot of their friends for these Easter brunches and then extended family were invited including my parents if they wanted to come um, other other people but one of the things that she decided to make after I came into the family or around the time is that she decided to return to cooking a homemade Easter cheesecake I'm sorry I don't know the name it's a Russian Easter cheesecake because her family had been in Russia and had to flee at the time of the Bolshevik Revolution in the early night well the late 19 teens uh, her mother and father escaped over the ice to Finland before she was born so there were some Russian traditions and Russian recipes and one of them was this cheesecake but it took a week basically to make because you would start it a week ahead and it was a combination of um, cottage cheese and cream cheese and sour cream and all kinds of spices and then it would cook on the stove well first you put it through a meat grinder and ground it all up together then you would cook it on the stove and add vanilla and other spices and then it was poured into a mold and it was a wooden mold and then the mold needed to stay upside down in the refrigerator dripping the uh, juices from the cheese or the excess fluid um, for a week after that time you could unmold the, the cheese and that photo was unmolding the cheese and then the cheesecake would look like this it was something of a pyramid and you would put a flower in the top uh, Easter lily is in the top and then it was eaten with a homemade bread that we also made the recipe and it was made in coffee cans and baked in the oven with lots of um, fruit and currants uh, the dried candied fruit anyway that was a big deal at Easter that and that was a very very special uh, cheesecake which would be the centerpiece of Easter but the rest of it would be a smorgasbord and it was a smorgasbord of all kinds of different cultures but a smorgasbord is a Scandinavian word so there are there were a lot of Scandinavian foods around the table but there were also the border influences with the Mexican food there was influences with the southern cooking and um, one of the one of my kids favorite things was the deviled eggs and she Oma made the best deviled eggs and my children still make that recipe to this day it has a little bit of paprika in it but the secret ingredient is curry when mixing up the egg yolks she would put a curry powder in with it and then put it back into the egg whites and because of such a large group being there you needed three dozen eggs because everybody would um, eat three four uh, 
my nephew would eat five. I mean, there were never enough deviled eggs to go around. We also had a, a Scandinavian type potato salad and we had a wonderful Scandinavian mixed vegetable dish that you serve cold and it's uh, basically the the small cut up veggies like you would get in a in a mixed vegetable frozen mixed vegetables it was a mini diced onion and uh, just barely any mayonnaise you could use a, a dollop of sour cream instead of mayonnaise mix it all together and then put a healthy, healthy amount, I mean lots, as, as much as a cup even, of uh, fresh dill. Dill was a big ingredient at my mother-in-law's house and that was part of the Scandinavian influence.